Hi folks, this is Jason. I uh, hope everybody's okay. And we're going to be talking for a while about Herman Bavink. And we're going to be talking about what Herman Bavink um, means to me. And why he's important to me. Why I'm passionate about Herman Bavink. And um, he is a guy who inspires me encourages me and uh, refreshes me, renews me and gives me great strength in my faith and he's a model theologian that uh, I look up to and has had a big influence in my life and continues to have an influence kind of standard um, that he um, he advocated. We're going to be looking at his Reform Dogmatics uh, for volume and getting a, a brief overlay of of that. Uh, but before we do, uh, we're just going to have a look at his life. Uh, information uh, source material is Walter A. Ewell Evangelical Dictionary of Theology. Herman Bavink uh, was lived from 1854 to 1921. Uh, he was, uh, without a doubt, one of the great theologians that Holland has ever produced, and he was a great Dutch Reformed scholar and theologian, Abraham Kuyper. Um, These theologians initiated a theological revival in the Dutch Reformed Church. And if you go to America today, you'll find that Dutch Reformed theology has had a big influence on theological education in America. Bavink uh, trained at Leiden and um, a theological seminary at, Camp at Campen. Um, he worked at a church in Frenica in 1881-82 and became professor of systematic theology at Camp at Campen in 1882-1902 and also um, professor of theology at the University of Amsterdam in 1902. He wrote his major work, Reform Dogmatics, in four volumes, published in 1895-1901 to and the Doctrine of God is in the English translation, translation uh, with the Banner of Truth, and also um, you can get the three volumes, the four volumes now, uh, published by um, um, but I think by um, uh, I'm trying to think who, who publishes it. So just get it for you. Uh, just get the publisher. Uh, initiated by the Dutch Reformed Translation Society and published by Baker Academics. So that's the background of the publication. Um, Bavink was uh, close to the separatist origins uh, in Dutch Reformed uh, church life. Um, he was a scholar who showed uh, interaction with all various types of uh, engaged with philosophy, sociology, psycho psychology, etc. Um, 
J. Van Engen says, uh, Bavink considered theology to be a systematic study of the knowledge of God as Christ revealed that regarding himself and creation in his word, a revelation made to the church as encapsulated in its creed or confession and received in faith by the individual theologian. Bavink's uh, philosophical orientation as revealed in his uh, Proglomena was more realist in contrast to Kuiper's inclinations to German idealism. End of quote. So that's a little bit about uh, Bavink. So we're going to look at his reform dogmatics and just see what a few things that he says. And we'll look at it. So we'll just give you a feeling uh, of, of his work. Okay. Okay, an outline of his work. Um, in the Reform Dogmatics, um, he talks about uh, dogmatic theology as a science. He talks about the history and literature of dogmatic theology. Uh, and I have to say that his grasp of the history of theology is outstanding. Uh, he talks about the foundations of theology. He talks about revelation, his defense of the doctrine of God. He talks about the Trinity. Uh, it talks about um, the image of God, the fallen world. Um, it talks about justification, sanctification, the church, spiritual reality, spiritual means of grace. Um, you name it, he, he talks about it. He writes... Throughout the history of the church, theologians have used different terms to describe the orderly study of the Christian faith and the summary of its truth content. Many Protestant theologians of the immediate post-Reformation period began to follow the Lutheran Philip Melchanon loci commune's commonplace in designating the various topics of theology. This term, a translation of the Greek, comes from classical writers such as Cicero, who used the term for the general rules of place where a rhetorician a, re a, a rhetoric rhetorician could find the arguments needed when treating any given topic. Loci, in other words, were the databases of the proof text barrels used by debaters as a source of material to bolster their arguments. For theologians seeking to serve the church, the loci were the places one could look for scripture's own statement about particular topics. Notice there that he's dialoguing with ancient Greek literature, uh, Roman literature, um, Protestant uh, Reformation, post-Reformation literature shows you the depth of his writing. Um, uh, here's another insightful bit of, of Bavink that you get. He goes for Frederick Schleimacher, 1768-1834, the content of the Christian faith is nothing more than the piety and faith of Christian beliefs at every given time. In his own words, Christian doctrines are accounts of the Christian religious affections set forth in speech, and dogmatic theology is the science which systemizes the doctrine prevalent in a Christian church at a given time. Others such as Albrecht Rachel in eighteen twenty two to eighty nine followed Kant more directly in construing the content of the Christian faith in Strickland March eighteen sixty five to nineteen twenty three made the historical, psychological and comparative scientific study of religions the object of theological inquiry and summary when dogmatic theology becomes nothing more than a description of the historical phenomenon that is called the Christian faith. It ceases to be theological theology and simply becomes the study of religion. Now notice there, uh, he mentions Schleimacher, he mentions e e e Albrecht Kalitschel, uh, Ernest Trollich, um, so you got uh, a classicist theologian who was well versed in Plato, you have e e Albrecht Kalitschel who was uh, a master of Kantian thinking you have Ernest Trollich who was a master in new historical methods. So in other words, uh, Bavink as a theologian is engaging on multiple disciplines. Dis, you know, he, he really is and trying to dialogue and, and come to an understanding of other people's positions when he's quoting these kind of thinkers. So that's why I like the reform dogmatics. 
I like it because of of this um, so I yeah um, that's why I like Bavink I like the fact that he engages with so many disciplines so many different scholars I like the fact that he writes simply I write the fact that he writes spiritually I write the fact that uh, of these things so here's uh, Sorry about this. <laughs> There's an article here. I like it. Some advantages of going Dutch by Carl R. Truman. Uh, Themelios, Volume 25, Number 3, um, 2000, in June. I think that would be uh, really, really good. Um, so, uh, anyway, we'll look at... Um, look at his uh, article on... So we'll, we'll read uh, Bavink's article on war. Uh, the Problem of War by Herman Bavink. This article was first written by Herman Bavink, Professor of Systematic Theology at the Free University Amsterdam in November 1914. Much of the material deals with the political problems peculiar to the time of writing and has therefore been omitted here. However, Bavink's survey of the Bible's attitude to the problem of war still merits the consideration of Christians today. After briefly mentioning the pacifist argument that Christianity and war are directly opposed to one another, reminds his readers of accusations leveled against the war. Then he continues, It is therefore surely worthy the effort to try to answer the following questions. What attitude is Christian ethics going to adopt towards war? Does war have a place in the Christian world life view? Or must war at times and in places be condemned and opposed as a crime. Does war make any sense, or is it never anything but gruesome injustice, brute force, and a work of the devil? In this investigation, the Old Testament need not detain us for very long, for no one can deny that in it war, it in again and again referred to as the divine right throughout the centuries from the time of Exodus in the 15th and 14th century BC up until the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Israel was involved in strife with the surrounding nations. This strife was looked upon religiously and ethically as a war waged by God of Israel against heathen gods. Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the Lord of God of the armies of Israel. 1 Samuel 17:45, a warrior. Exodus 15:3, mighty in battle. 24 verse Psalm 24 verse 8, who goes to war with his people. Judges chapter 4:14 equips the judges by his spirit, Judges 3.10, teaches divine art of war, girds his loins with strength and delivers his enemies to him for destruction, 2 Samuel 22.35. Just as he sometimes ordains the defeat of his people for their chastisement and humiliation, so he also grants victory in battle by, by divine aid. In many a psalm or hymn, therefore, such help is invoked, or gratitude is expressed for victory. Exodus 15, Judges 5, 2 Samuel 22, Psalm 3, Psalm 27, Psalm 46, Psalm 68. This is not only the people's view of war, but also that of the prophets. Abraham took part in the battle against the despots of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 14. Moses and Joshua, the judges and the kings, led Israel in battle against their enemies and around Canaan. 
Deborah stirs up her countrymen for battle against Sisera, the Canaanite general, Judges 4, verse 6 and 14. Samuel musters the children of Israel against the Philistines, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 5. An unnamed prophet encourages Ahab to wage war against Benadad of Syria, 1 Kings 2013. From Amos onward, the later prophets repeatedly proclaim that the great and terrible day of the Lord shall be preceded by awful wars, Amos 5, 7. Uh, but after that, the kingdom of peace will come to Israel and to all the nations of the earth. Then they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war and rich and abundant, that even the animal world and the nature will participate in it. The wolf shall lie down with the lamb, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 1 and 4, Isaiah 9 verse 2 and 7, Isaiah 11 6 and 9. All such peace shall accrue from the Messiah, who is the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9.5, Micah 5.5, 5, Zechariah 6.13, and to those whose kingdom of justice and peace there will be no end, Psalm 72.17, Isaiah 9.6. Now ancient Israel lived in circumstances completely different from those of the Christian community in the days of the New Testament, hence its history cannot simply be our directing principle or example. Nevertheless, the Old Testament propagates the view that war is not of itself unjust and unlawful in every case. Moreover, moreover in God's hands, it can serve as a means towards higher goals, toward the coming of the King. War is temporary, and at the coming of the Messiah, it shall immediately make way for the kingdom of eternal peace. Now it is at this point that the New Testament picks up the thread. For it is the Messiah who by this time has appeared to the person of Jesus, who brings peace on earth. Luke 2.14 guards our feet in the way of peace, Luke 1.29 and establishes a kingdom which consists of righteousness, peace and joy, Luke 19.34, Romans 14.7 this peace of course primarily religious in nature objectively it is the relationship of peace which Christ has established between God and man, Ephesians 2.17 Subjectively, it reveals itself in the blessed knowledge that we are reconciled to God and that no guilt will ever remove us from fellowship with him, Romans 5.1. This peace is bestowed on the community by the Father who is the God of peace, Romans 1.7, uh, Romans 15.33, which is called the Gospel of Peace, Acts chapter 10.36, Ephesians 6.15, and even now believers enjoy peace as a fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. However, this religious peace also has ethical results, for by his sacrifice, Christ not only brought reconciliation and peace between God and man, but also between various nations and people, Ephesians 2.14. Not that there is no longer Greek or Jew, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, male or female, but all are one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.28. Thus Jesus declares that not only the poor in spirit and pure in heart are blessed, but also the peaceful or the peacemakers. He says that these shall be called the sons of God, Matthew 5, 9. The Sermon on the Mount, he exhorts his disciples not to be contentious, but to be kindly disposed to their opponents, not to resist him who is evil, to love their enemies, to forgive until 77. The apostles exhort us to pursue peace and as far as possible to live in peace with all men, Romans 12, 18, Hebrews 12, 14. The New Testament ethical standard is so high that in practice it seems to be in now no way applicable. These words of peace and the gruesome reality of war stand in such sharp contrast that reconciling them seems to be impossible. Christ commands us not to resist him who is evil and to love our enemy. But in war the very opposite is required. Murder, burning, plunder, destruction, everything that contributes to the enemy's ruin and downfall. The antinomony has been felt in the Christian church since ancient times and has led to varying attempts to solve the problem. Some have dismissed the world as the domain of Satan and have either in isolation or in small groups sought to apply the fundamentals of Jesus' teaching. Others have reversed this and have rejected his teaching as thoroughly as have denied its value completely. Still others have struck a compromise by distinguishing between higher and lower ethics, between councils and commands, between clergy 
and laity. In quotes, the editor of the article, Bavinck then gives historical examples of movements of men who held to an uncompromising pacifist of pacifism of others who extolled the virtue of war. The former he names the Anabaptists, the Quakers, and Tolstoy, including in the later group are men such as Hegel, Spencer, and Bismarck. He then goes on. Neither of these sentiments, however, can be harmonized with Christianity. The champion of peace do indeed at all costs like to appeal to Jesus' utterances in the Sermon on the Mount. Yet by so doing, they forget the truths which also find expression in the Gospel. The Sermon on the Mount is not to be equated with Christianity, and the problem of war is resolved by an appeal to a single text. It is much rather part of a wider issue which touches on the relationship of Christianity to natural life as a whole, to the entire sinful world and all it contains. All this point, it must immediately be said that although passive morality is in the foreground in the New Testament, an active positive element is by no means lacking. The virtues which were then recommended to the Christians uh, via patience, long-suffering, for forbearance and meekness and submissiveness all played a large part. What else could be expected at time when Jesus' disciples were few in number small by the world standards and without any influence on public life. But it is all the more striking that Christianity is devoid of all aestheticism and from its very beginning took on a positive relationship to the world at large. This fact is principally found in the statement that God loved the world, that Christ came in not to destroy the world but to save it. From this focal point lines are drawn in all directions to indicate the pale, the place Christians are to occupy and the attitudes they are to have in this sinful world. They must not withdraw from the world, but being in the world, they are to keep themselves from the evil one. Nothing is of unclean of itself. All God's creation is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is to be accepted with thanksgiving. Marriage is honourable among all. The government is God's servant and is entitled to obedience and respect. Whoever becomes a Christian is to remain in the calling to which he was called. The prayer of Jesus, the disciple, is that God's name is hallowed and that his kingdom come, that he will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That his will will be done uh, on earth as it is in heaven. All this points not to an avoidance, but to sanctification of the world. In this connection, it is significant that the military profession as such. The soldiers who come to join John the Baptist did receive an order not did receive an order not to take money by force, but not an order to leave the service in Luke 3.14. Jesus expressed his amazement at the great faith of the centurion at Capernaum and healed his servant, Matthew 8.5. Later the centurion Cornelius and his whole household were baptized and admitted to the church, Acts chapter 10. Without having any scruples about it, Jesus in one of his parables speaks about a king who before going to war sits down and considers whether he, with 10,000 men, is able to meet his opponents who are 20,000, Luke 14, 31. Similarly, Paul takes pleasure in using military image to describe the life of the Christian, Romans 6, 13, 1 Corinthians 9, 7, Ephesians 6, 8, 10, 18. Even more striking is the fact that Jesus explicitly forbids the use of the sword for his defense, as the weapons of believers' warfare are not of the flesh, but but mighty before God, Matthew 26, 52, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. Yet he is just as definite in affirming that he has not come to bring peace on earth, but a sword, that is to cause discord between people and between the numbers of members of one family, Matthew 10, 34, 35. Therefore, when the disciples are presently to go out into the world to preach the gospel, they are to expect persecution and hate from the world. Then they will not only need a pursue and a purse and bag, but also a sword, i.e., they must be completely ready to engage in spiritual warfare against the world. Luke 22:36. The utterance of Christ clearly confessions which are of much greater value than the prosperity and, and peace 
The commands of the moral law are not all on the same level, but occupy a different rank. God comes before man, love for him is the great and foremost commandment, Matthew 22:38. We must obey him rather than man, Acts 5:29. His kingdom and his righteousness must therefore be sought above all things, Matthew 6:33. For the kingdom of heaven is a treasure and a pearl of great price, Matthew 13, 44, 46. The so man is worth more than all the whole world, Matthew 16, 26. The soul more than the body, life more than the food, the body more than clothing, Matthew 6, 25. These spiritual and material goods are not necessarily mutually exclusive. They can be possessed and enjoyed together. Yet in the present world they may clash and collide with one another again and again. Hence we are placed in the position the teaching of Christ and the Apostles then instructs us that we should without hesitation abandon the lesser in order to partake of the preserve the greater. For the sake of Christ and the Gospel, the right eye must be torn out and the right hand cut off. Matthew 5, 29, 30. Father and mother and son and daughter must be left, left life lost and, and the cross taken up. Matthew 10, 37, 39. Matthew 16, 24, 26. Christian morality includes absolute self-denial. Life, prosperity, and peace are not the highest possessions. There are cases where what is dearest must be forsaken, abandoned, and opposed. The martyrs have left us an example of this. Even Christ did not please himself, but for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Romans 15, 3, Hebrews 12, 2. We'll just stop for a rest for a minute. Testing, testing, yeah. Just having a rest for a minute. Thus the idea may yet be elucidated for another perspective. Our response to the moral law is love, which is the fulfillment of the law of the perfect bond of unity. Romans 13.10, Colossians 3.14. By this definition, Christian love is essentially distinguished on the one hand from Buddhist pity and on the other from so-called free love. According to Buddhism, the cause of all misery lies in being. All creation, especially creation that is alive, is thus lamentable and the object of pity. We must exercise the pity mainly for our own sake in order to achieve our deliverance and to kill within ourselves the desire for life. Schopenhauer unjustly identified this pity with Christian love. later is richer and stands on a higher plane. The mercy of Christianity goes much deeper than pity. It is not the single dominant virtue, but the disposition and expression of love in a particular direction with a view to the need of misery in the world. Love goes back much further. Love extends much further. To begin with, it has God and all virtues as its object. Moreover, it is also directs itself to all his works and creatures, not because they are lamentable, but because it is God that they live and move and have their being. Likewise, Christian love is basically different from the free love who praises and nowadays so frequently sung. This free love is really nothing but a lack of discipline and the emancipation of sentiment and passion. Christian love is rather the fulfilling of the law, is decreed by God's will and is man's duty which binds him by conscience. This is it. love is neither arbitrary nor a matter of personal in us to determine whom or what we should love. We must love God as he reveals himself uh, and not as we imagine him to be. We must love the neighbor whom God places next to us and not the one we choose. We must love the man, woman, parents and children God gives us and not another man or woman. We must love all that is true, righteous and pure. We must hate sin and avoid it no matter how beautifully it may present itself. This is therefore true, but also false, unreal, and counterfeit love. Likewise, there is good peace for which we must strive and seek to maintain with all men. But there is also false, sinful peace which should be broken. If within lies and injustice by way of concession, and for the sake of peace we make a treaty or quietly permit what is wrong, then we are being spineless and denying truth and virtue. Over against such false peace in Jeremiah 6.14. Jesus placed the claim that on the earth, Luke 12, 49. There are powers 
in this world which we can never live on peaceful terms. There are truths and rights and spiritual possessions and invisible treasures for which we must be willing to sacrifice everything, peace, quiet, respectability, reputation, even love of our family and of our own life. Conditions in this incomprehensible world may be so serious and complicated that love itself may be compelled us to break peace and engage in battle. Prophets such as Jeremiah would much rather have remained silent and spent their days in peace and tranquility, but they could not, nor were they allowed to. They spoke because they believed that they struggled against their nation because they loved it. By his great love for God and man, Jesus himself was moved to resist all evil forces, even unto death. The morality, of course, primarily refers to individual persons, but it also has significance for world powers. A nation is certainly not a mass within an arbitrary piece of land, but a living organism which has its roots far back in the past, which it is animated with a living patriotism in its very bone. Some people take pleasure in splitting the threads of this love into factors such as climate, soil, history and customs, etc., and then displaying in its foolishness, but so superficial an undertaking is self-condemning and is completely powerless in the face of the reality of this love. Love even for one's country always has mysterious character. It comes up out of the depths and is fed by hidden springs. For a time it may slumber and sleep, but then it reawakens with such irresistible power that even the coolest cosmopolitan is carried along with it. It then shows itself to be so enthusiastic, lofty and disinterested that it renders one prepared for a capable making the most demanding sacrifices. This points to the fact that when the Most High separated the sons of men from inheritance and set the boundaries of the peoples, Deuteronomy 32.8, he determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitations, Acts 17.26, and give each of them a place and a task in the history of humanity. In this respect, it makes no essential difference between uh, difference whether a nation be great or small. Lord George and Jane Bryce have James Bryce rightly remind us that relatively small nations have contributed to the increase of the most noble cultural traits as much as, if not more than, the larger nations. Therefore it's no arbitrary matter but rather one's calling and duty to defend those characteristics worn in hand if need be. It is true that in the Sermon on the Mount, namely in Matthew 5, 38, 42, Jesus calls his disciples to a spirit of forgiveness which we would do well to recall stands in direct contrast to the demands of retribution and is not susceptible to any quantitative computer. It is equally certain that Jesus is here speaking to those who understand and not formulating a law that has to be observed to the letter. He is merely stating a spiritual principle which demands a different application in accordance with the differing circumstances of life. Jesus himself acted in this way. John 18, 22, 23, and Paul, who preached the same spirit of forgiveness, Romans 12, 17, 21, 1 Thessalonians 5, 15, 1 Peter 3, 9, appeals to his rights as a Roman citizen, Romans 22, 25. Personal insults. Personal insults can and must be forgiven. But when truth or justice is assaulted in one's person, then, according to Christian principles, which place the kingdom of God and his righteousness above all else, it is one's duty to defend and give evidence. This obligation is contained even within the Christian virtue of self-denial. For the sake of Christ, the gospel, we should forsake everything at the same time. It presupposes that all things we must abandon have value and of themselves, even though it is be, uh, be a subordinate one. For whatever is worth nothing and does not cost us anything requires no self-denial when we have to forgo it. For example, life is a possession that may and must be defended if it is not in conflict with higher concerns. In the case of need, every man has the right and the duty to, to vend his life weapons in hand. An intruder into any house may be withstood with violence. Similarly, the authorities which are called to main justice do not bear the sword, even the sword of war, in vain. If necessary, in the case of an emergency, they must use the sword both at home and abroad. Truth and justice are worth more for a man, for a nation and for humanity as a whole than our life, peace, prosperity and tranquility. It is thus noteworthy that the Christian church in all its divisions has never can... The church herself, of course, may never go beyond 
preaching the gospel of peace and fighting with spiritual weapons. A holy war for the propagation of truth has been forbidden her by what Christ said to Peter. Yet she has never disputed the authorities' right to wage war in case of need. Passivists have resented her for this, but they would probably have reproached the church more strongly had she taken the liberty to mingle in state affairs and without further ado denied war its raison d'etre in this dispensation. The church may and must not do so. It is her calling, according to the word of Christ, to render to God the things that are God's and also to render to seed to the things that are Caesar's. Christian ethics, therefore, allows no other conclusion than that there can be good and just wars. Perhaps they are very few in number and even much fewer than we think. In every war, even the most just many things in humanity very strongly condemn. Yet neither the scriptures nor history give sufficient grounds to censor every war unconditionally. A war can be good and just provided that it comply with the demands of higher principles, serve the maintenance of justice, and only then be undertaken in the case of the most dire necessity. Its justification, then, does not lie in the right of might, nor in the virtues of patriotism, heroism, patience, steadfastness, unity, readiness to make sacrifice, etc., which may engender even less in the consequence liable to be brought about by victory, such as broadening perspective and, and expansion of culture or even of Christianity, and least of all in the philosophical convictions that all that exist is reasonable and that war constitutes an indispensable and precious moment in the development of the human race. If war is to be defended, it must itself pass the strict test of justice which resembles the disasters and adversaries of life in that it remains an evil, which may in God's holy hands nevertheless be used for the edification of the human race. The end and purpose thus remains peace, the eternal peace of the kingdom of God. Um, what I want to talk about here just for a few minutes is uh, I like the exegetical teaching of the Gospels and Jesus' teaching within the article and I think that was really good but then it seems to like jump a bit of logic it kind of really uh, nailed down exegetically and then it moves on into reflections about um, the justification of war, and I, I don't think the connection was made as strong as it should have been. Um, what do I think of the topic um, about war? Uh, I do think there is a difference between the church and the state. The church should not encourage or engage in war. The church is there to preach the gospel. Um, but at the same time, I think that governments, I do think the, the governments can and civil authorities can and should engage in war if uh, it's an act of justice and defence. Those are my thoughts. Um, very interesting article, uh, very thought provoking.
Um, I'll just read some of Pavink's um, epistemology here. So that's uh, Bavink on war. Uh, we looked at his dogmatics, reform dogmatics. We looked at an article on war, uh, and uh, we're going to have a look in a minute on. Um, Um, so we're going to have a look at Bavink's epistemology now. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. Okay. Um, so we'll just go into uh, just going to get some water. So what we're doing now is we're just Sam Smith, the first essential new album of 
a little break folks and so we'll continue our um, expose and uh, I just want to check see how long this is so far <laughs> So, <clears throat> we're on 48 uh, minutes, uh, so we're going to spend about half an hour on epistemology. We've looked at just a little bit of the reform dogmatics. Uh, we've looked at a little bit of um, Herman Bavink's uh, essay on war. Uh, I've also done uh, Herman Bavink's Christology uh, so if you go and look at that uh, you'll be able to look at that uh, so now uh, we're going to be looking at uh, Herman Bavink on um, his thinking concerning epistemology so I'm going to read and uh, stop. Okay. So I'll read a page, stop, think about it, and we'll go there. We'll do half an hour. He says the centuries preceding the French Revolution in 1789 are in many ways different from the epoch that followed. The radical change of direction introduced into the life and thought of the nations by this tremendous event shattered the continuity of history. 
We can project ourselves into thought and life of those preceding ages only with great difficulty. They were the ages of authority, objectivity, whereas in our era the subject proclaims its freedom of human existence. Admittedly, by taking its starting point in faith, the Reformation dealt a stunning blow to the authority that had previously encompassed all of life. In the Reformation, the believing subject rose against the oppressive authority of the infallible church and boldly shook off the painful yoke of an old tradition. Nevertheless, in the principles of the Reformation, Christians remained bound to God's word as it came to them in the Old and New Testament and in the Protestant church. The authority of that word was initially so unshakable that people really doubted it, not even in their heart. There was faith and there was certainty. No one felt the need for an inquiry into the final ground of faith, into the deepest foundations of certainty. People were convinced they possessed the truth, and no one questioned the writings on which the faith was founded, grounded. In times of doubt and we examined the foundations of your hope, you speak as one having authority, not like the Pharisees. After the middle of the 18th century, the situation gradually changed. The subject came into its own. It became aware of its true or presumed rights and slowly broke all the ties binding it to the past. In an unlimited sense of freedom, it emancipated itself from everything the past held sacred. All authority that demanded recognition and obedience had to answer first the foundational question, by what right do you demand my obedience? critical reason had been awakened, launching an inquiry into the ground of all authority, naive, simple, childlike faith all but vanished. Doubt was now become the sickness of our century, bring, bringing with it a string of moral problems and plagues. Nowadays many people take into account only what they can see, deify matter, worship mammon or glorify power. The number of those who still utter an undaunted testimony of their faith with joyful enthusiasm and complete certainty is comparatively small. Families, generations, groups and classes have turned away from all authority and broken with their faith. Even among those who still call themselves believers, how many must screw up their courage into force, unnatural belief, how many believe as a result of habit, laziness or lack of spirit, how many act out of an unhealthy attempt to recover the past or out of a misleading conservatism. There is much noise and movement but little genuine spirit, little genuine enthusiasm issuing from an upright, fear, fervent, uh, sincere faith. I'll just stop there and reflect on that, um, what he's saying. I like, what I like about him there is I, I I don't think, I, th I think he's right uh, in the French Revolution, I don't think we understand maybe the impact and the power of the historical times. Um, it was an age prior to that where there was certainty and the question is, is scepticism um, that I this is my thought is does skepticism have um, does it have to have a balance or do we have to have faith what I mean is the right to the French Revolution I think saying that there was a trust in authority. There was beginning to be an erosion of authority. And simplicity of faith kind of left the mark. I'm not too sure that that's a true understanding of the history of ideas and thinking in the church. I think theology has never, has never been a simplistic thing in, the Christian, in Christian history. But granted, there was perhaps an ethos of trust, an ethos of confidence of the truth. And granted, maybe that at the French Revolution was lost. So I take Bavink's point there. Um, 
my thinking then is that loss of confidence of simplicity of faith is unwarranted we can be so skeptical that we almost lose any certainty at all but then again we have to have faith because all knowledge ultimately is grounded on faith we there are things that we can't prove um, even if we're rationalist and so there has to be a nat some moder moderation of faith or medium of faith so I think that the ground of knowledge has to be based on a theistic point of view so basically we have to be critical and think but at the same time without a foundation of faith then we're not going to and our thinking will end up in nihilism I don't advocate and and, and I know that Bavink did not advocate uh, an, uh, a, a kind of putting your head in the sand against questions that people are putting to you that if your culture is challenging your faith that you need to think it through and answer the challenges in an honest fair way Bavink says nowhere is this more true than among theologians they are most doubting facilitating group of all they have plenty of questions doubts and criticisms to offer but what we expect from them more than from anyone else is unity of outlook consistency of method certainty of faith eagerness to give an account of the hope within them for these traits we often look in vain this phenomenon is not confined to a few theological schools it touches all parties who don't bury their heads in the great battle of the spirits the questions regarding the rights of faith and the ground of certainty is the dominating question not just in practical life but also in universities the more the Christian faith retreats from dealing with every possible question restricting its material content and the more it applies itself to building a rigorous foundation deducing all else logically from these fundamental principles the more it becomes inwardly weak and divided those seeking direction in this area are met by a motley array of options and opinions I like that by Bobby what he's saying there from what I get is basically saying look it's no good having your head in the sand Christianity must engage with the questions of the time if it's not it's going to be inward looking and fractured you can see that in the time of um, in the time of the um, American theology, um, at the time of the height of Princeton theology, uh, right about two thousand. Uh, uh, what? What? Is, sorry, uh, right about. 1920s you had scholars like B.B. Warfield and other scholars engaging with the wider scholarly community but then round about the 1940s 30s and 40s when Westminster Theological Seminary was set up and left Princeton Theological Seminary the scholars left Princeton uh, such as Dr. Machen and set it up set up Westminster uh, Seminary what you find is uh, an increasing development of uh, introvertedness in uh, with the intellectuals even though you had people like uh, Cornelius Van Til and others engaging with the wider scholar of the community there were beginning to be more internal philosophical battles and theological battles because uh, when Westminster Theological Seminary was set up uh, it also set up a new denomination and that denomination became fractured and divided concentrating on theological battles rather than, than actually engaging in the world so you can see that uh, Bavink's ideas uh, actually come to fruition and uh, come true in that if we don't engage with the questions of the time we become introverted and we lose our effectiveness 
He goes, thus our area of inquiry is circumscribed as holy ground, for it must be entered with reverence and fear. Here we touch the most intimate depths of the human heart. Here more than anywhere spirit, but at the same time a frank and biased attitude in order to understand the life of religion in its inner essence and to purge it of all untruth and error. Wisdom and care dictate that in pointing out the way to obtain the certainty of faith we first consider what this certainty of faith is and the different ways men have sought it. The question regarding certainty of faith is not only a, of scientific theological but also of practical religious importance. It is concerned not only to the theologian but also to the layman to belongs to not only in the study but also in the living room. It is not just a theoretical academic issue but a preeminently one of life and practice. No matter how wicked and fallen anyone may be as sometimes in this life he will encounter moments of passionate seriousness sometimes seized by the mystery of life, the power of death, the dread of judgment, or the fear of the Lord, as one preserved, observer put it, happiness leads us into paganism, but suffering leads us to Christ. When the drunken stupor in which we often live wears off, when the happy glow dulls and the conscience awakens, when we are overcome by the mystery of life or the pain of suffering, then we all become conscious of death and the grave of judgment in eternity. Then no one can maintain indifference or hide behind the shield of neutrality. In this respect, people are better than we are sometimes inclined to think. There are no atheists, no people with a heart of conscience, with a heart or conscience, or more precisely, God never leaves himself without a witness, whether it be through blessings or through trials, he speaks to the conscience of each and every person. Uh, I think that's very profound that he says. I think it's really profound. He's basically saying reality bites. That you can be a skeptic and, and say that there is no God, there is no truth. But whether you're a skeptic or not, you're going to have to deal with suffering. You're going to have to deal with, with the reality of life. And it's at those points that we begin to realize that our skepticism is not enough uh, to deal with the problems that we face. Uh, Bavink says, true, many seek to stifle this voice and sear their conscience with uh, a counterizing uh, uh, an iron. And many have doubtless become very adept, persisting in their false assurance of disdainful indifference unto their deathbeds. But history also gives us incontestable evidence that the human has not been extinguished even in the most hardened sinner. For God sets up a responsive cord somewhere deep in the heart. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Isaiah 48:22. By nature, each of us spoils this peace. No one stands blameless before the accusation of his conscience. No one is in himself assured that things will get go well in life and the later in death. The assurance of salvation is not something you can inherit. No one is born with it, neither is it the fruit of human effort, nor a reward for duties consciously performed. We seek in it vain in the treasures of this earth, in life's joys, in the prayers of the masses, and in the fame of scholarship, in the acclaim of the arts, or in anything here below we are going, we must know that our personhood is more than the ripples in the ocean, that the moral battles stand far above the natural order and that the highest and purest are not illusion but reality. We must know how we can be liberated from the accusations of our conscience and from the weight of sin. We must know that God is and that he is our God. We must be sure we are reconciled to him and therefore approach death and in judgment without terror. In all this, our greatest need is for certainty. It is the deepest, although often unconscious, need of the human soul. He's coaching it in religious languages, and I, I think that he's a very canny thinker, actually. Uh, basically, he's, he's basically, through his language there, he's actually saying that reality is moral. 
And when you think about it, post enlightenment thinking was saying reality is rational. Um, but I think he's saying right, reality is ultimately first moral. Um, and I think he goes on to influence. Uh, Dovia Wood or Doya Wood, the Dutch Reformed philosopher, and I, th I can see Doya Wood in Bavink. In other words, Bavink's not going to Kant, and, and he's quite capable of doing so. He's talking about conscience because he recognizes that the reality of human nature is ultimately primarily uh, a moral reality mankind says Bavink has sought for certainty all through the ages all although along the wrong roads and with the wrong methods every religion no matter how distorted seeks for the highest and holiest known to man every religion is born out of and sustained by Believers value their religion above all other blessings. Every genuine follower holds his religion as the central and only unconditional necessity. To him, religion is life in the deepest essence. Religion is the only way for persons to attain what they desire for this life and the next. Whatever is considered the most real, the highest, the truest kind of life is the, con is the con content and subject of religion. In religion, we assure ourselves of our unconditional and enduring existence. We confronted by life's deepest problems, science has often taken a stance that conflicts with the seriousness of these problems. This is unworthy of science itself. Science is often content to characterize these questions as important for lesser men and for the unsophisticated, but of no significance to the scientific community. This belief, however, is not in no way do we wish to belittle the great accomplishments of modern science. It has made astounding discoveries and its achievement it, and achievements. It has enriched and eased human existence immeasurably. We all gratefully enjoy the knowledge and power it has given us over nature. But although it may have a lot to offer our senses and our understanding, it leaves the heart unsatisfied. In the art of suffering and in the face of death, what good comes from the conquest of nature and the blessings of civilization, the triumph of science and the enjoyment of the arts? What good does it do a man if he gives the whole world and loses his own soul? I really like that about Bavink. I like, I like the fact that he calls science out. It, it immeasurably does my head in uh, when I hear skeptics and talk about science if it's the kind of be all and end all. But like Bavink. Uh, science is all, only answer certain questions. It can't answer all the questions, especially the big questions of life. And so science has a role. It's a very important, significant role, but it's not the be-all and end-all. And I agree with Bavink there. Bavink says, science is mistaken if it passes by these serious problems of human life with an indifferent shrug. The consciousness of good and evil, the awareness of sin, righteousness and judgment, the accusations of conscience, the fear of death, the need of reconciliation are just as real as a matter as matter and energy as size and number. In fact, they are realities of tremendous import for they rule the world and mankind life and history. Just an aside, this is one of the reasons why I think evolution is desperately wicked and a desperately evil uh, thing in our Western culture. We have masses of Christians who become uh, a culture that is immersed in in um, evolutionary ideas, and many people are convinced 100% that evolution is true. But here's the problem: if you look at human nature, human nature is a moral creature, has moral parameters and directions uh, in its behaviour. Now. Morality is something that is basically at the heart of the human condition. Now here's the problem. If you're an evolutionist, then basically morality is not the heart of your agenda. Because 
you can't get a morality from evolution. If you try to do so, you'll commit the is or fallacy, you'll commit the naturalistic fallacy. Uh, basically, you can't get off the ground and do a morality. And that all comes to the Enlightenment and the emphasis on rationality, as if this was important, and the ditching of uh, morality. And in terms of the central plank uh, to knowledge, um, so yeah, um, I forgot what I was talking about there, but um, if science, as Bavink asserts, that there is no God, no good and no evil, no judgment and no punishment, no heaven or hell, then let it give us sufficient incontrovertible proof. That's what I'm getting at. I agree with Bavink there. Science has its role, but it can't legislate or state or, or comment on certain things the meaning of life etc so I agree with Bavink that you've got to have wider parameters of thinking so I agree with him there I'm going to go now uh, I'm just getting tired um, I think we'll do an evening on Bavink's book um, because it's very fascinating. So we're on page 15, and I think I might come back to this and do a full, full book. So this is just a, a little introduction to Buffing. I would encourage you to go and buy the books, go and read him, and you'll be blessed. Uh, if I get a chance in the next few days or weeks ahead, I'll do a full video reading this book and thinking about it from page 15 onwards okay so thank you for listening we're going to go and uh, it's evening and uh, thank you for listening and i hope to see you soon and so god bless you uh, this is just a little introduction to bav inc uh, we've looked at an article we've looked at uh, his reform dogmatics and we've looked at his uh epistemology a little bit about why he thinks there must be a wider engagement uh, with some of the big questions and we can't just be scientific materialists we have to answer the big questions of life okay thank you for listening and I uh, hope to see you soon this is Jason uh, signing off God bless <laughs>